this video, we're going to look at the conduction shape factor. First, we'll define what it is. We'll talk about using conduction shape factors in resistance networks for two-dimensional geometries. And I'm going to show you an example of how to calculate a shape factor if you can't find one yourself. So let's imagine we have a two-dimensional geometry. In this case, perhaps there's a heated rod embedded in a square box full of insulation with a conductivity K. And let's say we know the temperature of the heated rod and the temperature outside. Now, of course, we're going to have heat transfer from the heated rod to the outside through this insulation of conductivity uh, K. And that heat transfer is going to be affected by all of this geometry. Well, if we characterize that Q in terms of this S, which is our conduction shape factor, times the conductivity times this temperature difference, then all I need to know is what is this S, the conduction shape factor. Perhaps there's some way of determining this solution. Maybe I could measure it. Maybe there's an analytic solution. And in fact, the governing equation for two-dimensional conduction, if you think back to it, is the Laplace equation, which is a linear equation that comes up in many, many, many different applications, and there's a wide array of solutions uh, to that equation. And so there are many different solutions available for different types of geometries. And you can look up from those solutions what these values of S's, S's are for geometries such as this and many others. And if you look that up, then you can calculate that heat transfer rate. And of course, if you determine Q somehow, perhaps you carry out an experiment and you want to develop your own equation for the shape factor, then that shape factor rearranging this is, of course, that heat rate going out of there uh, times the conductivity divided by the temperature difference. Now, we can also use this in resistance networks. If we know what the shape factor is, of course, comparing the definition of our, resist of our thermal resistance, we can see that the definition of a thermal resistance for this case is 1 over the shape factor times the conductivity. And that's handy when we want to use this in a resistance network. Perhaps we don't know the temperature on the outside. What we know is that there's an ambient temperature in the room and a convection coefficient. Well, we can easily formulate a resistance network going from T1, the surface of our embedded rod, through to our unknown T2 at the surface, and through a regular convection resistance out to T infinity with 1 over H times this entire uh, surface area for heat transfer. And our resistance for this particular geometry is the shape factor we look up for this geometry at a, and use 1 over SK for the thermal resistance. So it's a very handy thing to do. And again, there's lots of information you can look up to find shape factors for various two-dimensional geometries. I'd like to look at a particular geometry that interests me as a fuel cell researcher, but it could be equally applied to heat exchangers. Perhaps we have a heated surface down here, and we're providing uh, some kind of channel here, and the pathway for heat transfer can't go through that channel, it has to go through a part of this geometry. So you can think of various applications, but in a fuel cell, uh, this is where the gases are applied, the conductivity of the gases is very, very low, and there's a solid applied here which goes to cooling channels, and so all of the heat generated by the fuel cell has to pass out through this smallest area. Let's think about what a shape factor for this would be. It has a dimension of a width this way and a height this way, and I've taken this for now uh, for this area where T1 is applied to be half of this geometry. Well, I've written a two-dimensional conduction uh, code in Python that I've used to solve this. Now, I'm going to look at this. Uh, first, I'll set uh, the temperature here to be 50, and the temperature, sorry, the temperature here to be 50, and the temperature here to be 100. And all of these other boundaries are insulated. So I only have these temperature boundaries here. And I'm going to start by solving this using uh, 10 volumes in this direction and 6 volumes in this direction. That's going to give me with a spacing for my volumes given here. And I'm going to solve for the heat transfer rate, solve for the temperature distribution, and of course I can calculate the heat transfer rate by approximating the gradient at these surface. I've used a second order parabolic fit to the first three points, and then multiplying that temperature gradient times minus the conductivity times a little bit of area here, I get the little heat flux here, and I add that up for all of these. And so for example, my west boundary, which is insulated, uh, is not perfectly insulated with this low spacing, but it's very small, 46 watts, compared to the, the 27,000 watts, which is going through the north and south boundary. So you can see these are well matched. Uh, out of 27,600 watts, I have an imbalance here of 3.47 watts because of my small resolution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase this and look at this now 
with 20 volumes by 12 volumes for a smaller spacing for my volumes. And I'll see that my error is getting smaller. Now for still 27,000, now 900, a slightly different prediction of the heat rate, uh, I have an imbalance of only 0.1 watts. So it's getting better. Now we can look at the solution and see that, of course, heat transfer is going from the high temperature to the low. The heat flux is always perpendicular to the temperature contour, so you can see that it's spreading out through this material and moving down and out this volume. We can also see where the contour lines are closer together. We have higher heat fluxes and lower heat fluxes, and of course, far away where it's insulated, we have much lower heat fluxes with these temperature contours very far apart. Let's continue to make this uh, the control volume smaller and see if we get a better estimate. You can see that between the coarse one that we just had, these lines are very coarse and they're smoothing out as we make it finer. And of course, these insulated boundaries mean that the, heat, the temperature contour has to hit them perpendicular because the temperature gradient has to be zero for there to be a zero heat flux. And you can see they're getting better and more perpendicular to these boundaries. So let's make it bigger again. I'll double it again. Now it's 40 by 24. Our prediction has gone down uh, a little bit more even, and our imbalance has gotten much smaller again, and our diagram looks even nicer. These lines are much smoother. These lines are even more uh, perpendicular to the boundary. I'm going to go one more step. I'm going to double it again, 80 by 48, and a slightly smaller. Now we have a very small imbalance, 10 to the minus 3 watts compared to 28,200. So let's put out this all together and look at what this is. Of course, the, the insulated boundaries have very little heat flux through them, they should be zero. And the north, the north boundary and the south boundary have equal heat fluxes coming in, in the negative direction. What's coming in is what's going out in the negative x direction of the south boundary. So let's put this together. I can plot these heat fluxes as a function of the delta x, the spacing in my numerical approximation. And as my spacing gets smaller and smaller, we saw that the heat flux was decreasing. These are the four cases that we simulated. But as I continue to make delta x half the size, so delta x here is half the size it was here, here is half the size it was here, my change in my predicted heat rate is getting smaller and smaller. Well, I can extrapolate this down to a delta x of zero quite easily. And I can get a predicted heat rate when delta x goes to zero. Of course, that's a relatively small change compared to the big change we had when our mesh was too coarse. So we could keep making a finer mesh, or we can estimate it based on extrapolating this down to where delta x is zero. And if I do that, my estimate of q as dx approaches zero is minus 28,284, this point right here, watts. And that means I can calculate the shape factor q over k over the difference in temperature here and here, and that gives me a shape factor of 1.41. So now I know a shape factor I could use for this particular geometry. Let me show you uh, what it looks like if I plot. Of course, I've calculated everywhere the heat flux. So in the orange color, I've plotted the heat flux across this top boundary. You can see that up to x equals 0.5, we have an increasing heat rate coming in through this boundary, and you can tell that it's increasing by looking at these contour lines getting closer and closer, so you see that it's increasing. You also see that it's smaller right in the corner, and that's because my very first control volume that I calculated on is only a half control volume, and all the others are full control volumes. So that's why you see this jumps at these corners. But you also see that at this sharp interface where I go from having a temperature specified to an insulated boundary, it's not perfect. This should go down to zero for the insulation, and it takes a couple of volumes to do that. This points out that if you really want to do a good job in these numerical simulations, you shouldn't use a constant grid spacing. In fact, you should make very small grid spacing right around this feature where we have a discontinuity, and then we would get an even better estimate. Of course, we compensate for that by extrapolating um, to the dx being zero, but it would be better. Uh, to concentrate those, those grid points there, those control volumes there, and then you could use smaller grids and get a better solution. And of course, on the south boundary, that's the blue line, we can see, again, these contour lines are closer together and these are farther apart. And so you can see that that heat flux along the south boundary is continuously getting smaller and smaller in absolute terms. And that when we integrate this and this, we get the exact same value because what came in 
goes out. Now let's look at changing the delta t. Before I had 100 degrees here and 50 degrees here, now I'm going to try it with 50 and 25, just to show you that picking the temperature difference doesn't matter. It cancels out in the solution. So when I carry out the same thing, my heat rates are much smaller because I have a smaller temperature difference, 25 degrees instead of 50 degrees. I extrapolate back and I get a heat rate for zero, and I calculate my shape factor, and it's identically 1.41 as it was before. That this is a linear equation ultimately that we're solving and the temperature difference that we choose does not make any difference to the answer when we've normalized it as we have in defining a conduction shape factor. What will make a difference however is changing h. If I make this a height 0.25 instead of a 0.5, now my aspect ratio has changed. It's four times longer this way than it is this way and if I carry out the same analysis again, what I see is now I'm calculating it a conduction shape factor of 2.44. So changing the size has definitely changed it. Now you can think about doing many more cases and presenting the data in similar ways to its presented in textbooks or in the literature such that you could create a useful correlation for shape factors for this situation uh, that anyone could use in their calculations or that I could use in my fuel cell research.